Good evening and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Andrew Schwartz and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our first uh, Schieffer Series panel of the season. So this is really a treat. And before we even start, I I'd like to uh, say hello to one of my bosses, our trustee, General Scrocroft. Thank you for being here, sir. I have another great announcement. Um, there's, there's another gentleman in this room who um, nobody knows this yet. You're the first to actually hear it outside of the CSIS family. But uh, as of uh, probably tomorrow or next week, I will be issuing a press release that says that uh, Mr. Bob Schieffer is one of CSIS's newest trustees. Hey. <laughs> and we are so thrilled to have Bob join our board. Um, welcome to all you Horn Frogs and TCU who make this possible, and to the uh, Stavros Nyarkos uh, uh, Foundation that makes this possible. It's so important. Your support uh, means the world to us. Um, we've got a terrific panel tonight um, on the timeliest issue, one of the timeliest issues uh, that we're facing in the foreign policy world and national security. So with that, I'll uh, welcome Bob Schieffer. Thank you all very much. And let me just say, I've, uh, I think one of the nicest honors I've ever had is to be asked to be on this board. And uh, I, uh, I'm really, really uh, excited about it. Uh, we have a great panel today. Uh, my friend David Sanger, uh, national security correspondent for the New York Times on two Pulitzer uh, teams, winning Pulitzer teams at the uh, New York Times probably knows as much about this issue as anybody except these two people, and they know just as much as David does. Jay Solomon, uh, who gets a lot of stories and, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. How long have you been covering uh, diplomatic stuff? I've been on it about five years. Five years on that. He comes by it naturally. His dad uh, was uh, uh, United States ambassador. Is he here? Today? He is. Back there. There he is. <laughs> Ambassador, stand up. Let us say hi to you. <laughs> I see. And my friend Margaret Brennan, who I must say is the best hire at CBS News uh, in about the last 10 years. Uh, she covered uh, global economics for about 10 years for Bloomberg and uh, CNBC. Graduate of the uh, University of Virginia, was a Fulbright Scholar. Uh, speaks Arabic, studied Arabic uh, in the Middle East, and uh, Margaret, I have to, it's the first question I've got to ask you, what is this all about? <laughs> um, I just got back two days ago from the Middle East. I was in Egypt for a wedding, so it's not a tattoo, it's henna, uh, which is a traditional sort of decoration you do, and it hasn't faded yet, so... It looks like I drew on myself with magic marker. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought we ought to clear yeah. that up before we, <laughs> before we got into the, to the question. Well, as I'm sure uh, most of you know, uh, the uh, Senate, uh, well, how do I say this? The Senate didn't block the treaty, uh, or it's not a treaty, it's the, the uh, Iran agreement. Uh, the motion to proceed, as it were, uh, uh, failed by uh, two votes. So the agreement, I guess we can say the agreement is there now. Uh, the House is uh, uh, over there. They, they're in some sort of an argument among themselves about what they want to do. And it, from what I can figure out, they really uh, have not come to any kind of a conclusion. Uh, the Republicans are trying to block it, but they can't figure out how they want to go about doing that. The Democrats, I guess, are for it. But uh, is, am I right in saying, Margaret, for all practical purposes, this agreement is now in place. Well, there's nothing that the administration believes Congress can do to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, the implementation doesn't You don't start. hear? Are these mics not on? My microphone is on here. On again? Can you hear me now? Sounds All right, good. now we're working. Um, the, when it comes to actual implementation, implementation day, quote unquote, isn't a date on the calendar. It actually won't start rolling out until uh, a good many months from now. So this isn't immediate after they resolve this fight in Congress. It's not like all of a sudden the deal is in place, but the diplomacy really can't be unwound. It can be damaged, but the agreement is there, and uh, it looks like it's going forward. Well, for, for 
but it's my understanding that Republicans are going to make another run at next week in the Senate at, at trying to, uh, to block it, but uh, the consensus so far seems to be that that's not going to go anywhere. So, so uh, where do we go now from here? What, what does happen now? Margaret says it'll be a few months before it actually uh, is in place, but what, what's the next step here? Well, I think immediately what's going to be interesting is last week the Supreme Leader of Iran said his parliament, the modulus, has to vote on it. So in the next couple of weeks, the Iranian parliament, they're going to have their say. And one of the, the still kind of unclear characters in this whole thing is the supreme leader. He has not sort of formally endorsed it yet. Um, he's kind of said negative things. He's really ramped up his anti-Israel rhetoric. He said Israel's going to get wiped out in the next 25 years uh, yesterday. So. The Iranian political situation still has to play out kind of in reaction to what happens here. And then one of the other kind of wild cards that could block what Margaret was talking about, which is implementation day, is the IAEA is doing an investigation into past military work, evidence that the Iranians had been trying to build a nuclear weapon. They're supposed to put out this report by the end of by December. And they're supposed to have kind of gathered all their information by mid next month. Technically, if, if the Iranians aren't cooperating, and there's a lot of evidence they aren't, a lot of evidence they're not, the, the IEA could say, these guys didn't cooperate in addressing this past work, and therefore the deal can't go forward. I don't think anyone thinks the IEA, I think they're under incredible pressure to just say, okay, they, they kind of played ball, and that's going to get kind of dealt with. But that, to me, that's one of the real dangers of this agreement as it stands. The issue of its weaponization, I don't think it's going to be addressed. And that's going to kind of be lurking there for the next 10 or 15 years as this agreement plays out. Uh, let me just go back to the first thing you said about the Iranian <laughs> parliament. Does anybody seriously think that the Iranians themselves won't approve this deal? I don't think so. I think most people think Khomeini was kind of using that to say, OK, if the, if the Congress does block it or does something really crazy, I can use my own parliament as a way to back out of this and, and kind of protect myself. I think most people don't think, don't think Khomeini really likes to sort of take a position. He always wants to have an out. So he has the, that political space to do it. But I think now that the politics here seem to be kind of clarified, I think this assumption is that the, the parliament will sort of kick and scream, but it will go forward. And there was an interesting poll out um, in the last two days, I think AFP published it um, in English, of the Iranian public. Um, to the degree that it's accurate, I don't know, but it was saying basically how the Iranian public believes they're actually getting far more than what is in the deal itself as we know it. They believe sanctions are going away entirely, virtually overnight. They believe that their government really hasn't given ground to the degree that the deal itself has um, actually put limitations on enrichment and development. So the public's expectations certainly seem high, but, but exactly what Jay said, it's actually, all of this comes down to implementation. Right now we're arguing about words on a page. It doesn't really matter until it's put in place, and that's when we can judge you know, whether yeah. it's a success or not. David, you uh, and your colleague uh, over at the Times put out a pretty lengthy question and answer. <laughs> Piece. Is that going to be in the paper paper tomorrow? It's, I think it's already <laughs> you know, on the. It's already online. We, we use the paper as sort of a, more of an afterthought now mm -hmm. after you put it online, right? Uh, but I, I, I assume so. But uh, the essence of it is sort of just to lay out, uh, as Margaret and Jay just have, what it is that's got to get done. And the list is pretty big. Well, I was going to say, just uh, from your own list, tell mm -hmm. us. What are the things that uh, you think are the most important things we need to know here, and uh, what, what's the takeaway? Here? So there's the most important, and then there's the most controversial, which I think Jay uh, hinted at with the uh, IAEA. So here's a list of the things they have to do. They have to ship about 98% of their fuel out of the country before the sanctions get lifted. They have a choice. They can either ship it out or they can dilute it down. It doesn't look like they have the technology right now to dilute it down or at least do it that fast. So they're going to have to do something that they spent a lot of time telling the three of us when we were in Lausanne uh, in the spring that they would never do, which is send it out of the country. Secondly, they're going to have to decommission about 13,000 of their 19,000 centrifuges. 
And uh, that's probably more easily achievable. Thirdly, they're going to have to take all of the inner workings of the Arak reactor, that's A-R-A-K uh, uh, reactor, and particularly that part of it that basically uh, produces plutonium, and remove that and submit a redesign uh, that would, would not take them to, to bomb grade uh, uh, uranium. And then they've got to go answer these questions from the IAEA. So the first three things we mentioned are all highly measurable. And I would doubt they're going to cheat on those in the beginning because it's going to be pretty obvious. With the IAEA, they have a chance to play a lot of games. There are these two, what the Republicans call secret side agreements and what the IAEA calls their usual confidential agreements between the agency and any country being inspected. Those usually aren't made public, including the agreements they have with the United States about what they inspect uh, here. But in this case, it gets to the heart of the central question, which is, are they serious about allowing the inspections to happen? One of the agreements which would take them into a place called Parchin, which is where there are believed to have been some experimentation done before, uh, all the indications are that the um, Iranians will be taking their own samples under some kind of IAEA remote monitoring and then turning them over to them. I'm not sure that, say, the National Football League or baseball, the Baseball League would allow this for drug testing for their players. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, second, the second thing they've got to accomplish is that uh, they've got to answer these questions that Jay laid out. There are a dozen very hard questions that they've avoided for many years about work they did on designing nuclear triggers, work they believed to have done on, on uh, designing a warhead itself. Now, the way this is worded, the IAEA only has to certify that they're beginning to get answers, but they do not have to certify that they were satisfied with the answers. So it's not clear, for example, that they actually have to let them go in and interview a man named Mohsen Fakharizde, who was the lead designer of many of the weapons programs. They've never been able to interview Fakharizde or any of his other staff. And so the question here is, what will constitute good enough for the IAEA? And one other interesting part on this is the Supreme Leader is all, the Iranians deny they ever had a weaponization program. Throughout the negotiations, they said, we've never had it. The documents are forged. It doesn't happen. And the Supreme Leader put out a fatwa. So it's against our religion to have tried to develop a nuclear weapon. One of the interesting questions are if the IAEA puts out assessment that, yeah, they did have a weapons, weapons program, but we're satisfied enough that the agreement goes forward, how would the Supreme Leader respond because you're basically challenging his whole political base. And that, that's something that by the end of the year, they're supposed to put out this report. And no one knows how the IAEA is going to handle this. What bothers, I'd like to just ask all th three of you, what bothers you about this agreement? And what makes you feel good about this agreement? I mean, what do you think is the best part of it, Jay? And what do you think is the part that you're really concerned about? Well, I think, I think this agreement is a big bet politically because they're going to maintain their infrastructure to make weapons. And in 10 years, they're unrestrained, basically, <laughs> even though they'll, they'll be monitors. But they can have an industrial scale nuclear program. And that's a real problem. I, I don't think the president says it, but most people say <coughs> Khomeini 75, it's probably not going to live much longer. You could have a very different Iran in 10 years, and we're just not that worried about it. And we bought. 10 years and we averted the potential of an Israeli strike, or I think that's the potentially good part. I think the really dangerous part is I find it very hard to believe the Saudis, the Emiratis, or some of these other Gulf countries are not going to look at 10 years from now when the Iranians are basically going to be unrestrained and say, we're going to have to have the same technology as they do. And the Saudis, we know, have a relationship with Pakistan. They could potentially bring in a weapon from Pakistan. So I think the proliferation threat is real. And I think the White House has really kind of pushed that away or said it's not really a problem because they don't have that technology. And I think the fact that you're lifting a weapons embargo on, these, on the Iranians and the missile embargo, I think you could definitely see it feed into what we're seeing right now across the region, which is an arms race and kind of 
inflame the Sunni Shia conflict even worse. And I think that's, I mean, the, the White House has been talking about, okay, as part of this agreement, we're gonna give even more weapons to the Arabs and even more weapons to the, the Israelis. I don't see how that's gonna stabilize that region. Margaret? I would say, if, if you really listen to what both many of the Arab diplomats would say to you privately and what the Israelis will say publicly, if you parse what they're saying, a lot of these complaints aren't actually about the nuclear program per se. It's really about Iran's role in the region. Most of the complaints are about, and concerns are about empowerment and emboldenment um, to destabilize uh, throughout the region, throughout the world. And so that's what's interesting in this, is it's, it, it is a long-term bet in many ways on the future of Iran, um, but it's also a long-term bet that Iran, while weak, could be the strongest, perhaps most stable in a very unstable region. And that's a huge gamble um, for the administration and for all the neighbors um, who, frankly, look at what Iran is doing in Syria, what Iran is doing throughout the region as a, you know, perhaps it's true stripes, and that it wants more influence, and it will be um, trying to expand right next door to them. So I think that's really a lot of what we're hearing, truly, is that concern. It has much less to do with enrichment and centrifuges, um, which is why it's so interesting, um, because the whole technical aspects of this are fascinating. But people are really concerned about what Iran will be doing. David? I think the best part of the agreement is the fact that the Iranians would have a very difficult time rebuilding a serious nuclear infrastructure over the next 10 to 15 years without getting caught. The first 15 years of it look a whole lot better than, say, the agreements that were struck with North Korea, which were three or four pages long uh, more than a decade ago. Um, this is highly detailed. And I think the chances that they would get caught are pretty high if they do a big cheat. Um, no Republicans who, there are no, interestingly, there are no Republicans voting for this at all. And uh, Matt Bunn up at Harvard made the interesting point the other day that if you look back over the history of arms control uh, agreements that passed in Congress, uh, over the past uh, decades, uh, and General Scowcroft would be the, the expert on this, this subject, there has never been one that has passed that didn't have at least some significant measure of bipartisan support. And so if you think of this in that regard, the idea that you've got one party that's basically issuing no votes for it, that's a little bit uh, of, a, of a change. Um, what worries me? Uh, a few things. Someone's going to have to buy off the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and allow them to go do something. And maybe it's going to be something uh, in the realm of uh, uh, missile activity. Maybe it'll be support to Hezbollah. Maybe it'll be more work to prop up Assad, although they must think that he's a declining asset right now. I think there's a good chance, Bob, that they'll pour a lot of this money into their second favorite weapon, which is cyber because it's not covered by any international agreements any place, and you can actually go out and use it, unlike nuclear weapons and unlike ballistic missiles. So uh, I think there are a fair number of risks that the administration has not wanted to go play up as they have discussed this. And I thought it was very interesting to hear the tone of Secretary Clinton's speech yesterday, where she talked about setting this agreement in a broader Iranian containment strategy. And I wondered, as I was listening to it over at Brookings, whether this debate might have sounded a little different had President Obama basically given the same kind of speech when he spoke at AU at the end of July. Well, let, let, let me just, I'm sorry, did you want to say something, Margaret? Well, I did want to say, I don't know if this is a, uh, this is a positive per se, but it's an unknown, and certainly be an unknown for whoever is in the White House next. Um, <clears throat> we now do have a regular reason to be speaking to the Iranians in some fa form or fashion. And we haven't had it for quite some time. And there's enormous potential there. I don't know what that means, truly. Um, the administration, while they'll say to you, no, this is just about the nuclear deal, I mean, everyone knows nothing is truly siloed here. Nothing is clearly in one lane. Everything crosses over. Everything influences uh, yet another country in the region. So the fact that you have John Kerry 
and Javad Zarif, knowing each other quite well and continuing to talk, we should say, is an interesting development. And it's going to be one that it could go many directions, but it's one to watch. Although one question we, we all have is, Carrie's meeting was Javad Zarif. He lived 20 years in the United States, he studied in San Francisco, he speaks English as well as us. You talk to even a lot of diplomats who've talked with the Iranians, and they, they try to engage Zarif on Syria and Iraq, and he'll say, that's, that's not my brief, that's the right. Revolutionary Guards, that's a, a general named Ghassan Soleimani who was behind a lot of what was going on in Iraq, the buildup of the Assad regime and in response to the revolution. I don't think, I'm sorry, the uprising in Syria, I don't think any of us who's covered this closely really can tell, like, is there any connection at all between these diplomats who show up in Lausanne and you know, speak beautiful English and the guys who we think really run the country? Mm -hmm. And it's the Supreme Leader, and it's the IRGC, and the guys who are meeting with, I mean, there's a lot of reports that this general was in Moscow in July meeting with Putin, and I think there's perception this buildup we're seeing in Syria now might be related to this. So that, that's the disconnect. Is the guys we, are the, is Arif and the guys we're talking about going to bring change, or was it just kind of a, a moment? You know, Bob, Jay's absolutely right on that, but we also had the question a year ago, did Zarif have the authority to go negotiate this deal? And he negotiated the deal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the end, the Supreme Leader, while he hasn't exactly danced up and down about it, has also not said no. And, you know, in 2009, we saw the Supreme Leader kill a deal. It was much smaller over the Tehran research reactor, <coughs> uh, a reactor that the United States gave uh, to the Iranians during the days of the Shah. Uh, actually, I think Dick Cheney was, played a role in that as he was chief of staff under Ford at the time, but that was missed in the speech the other day. Um, but, uh, but having given them this, this technology and gone in that, in that direction, um, uh, we're at the point right now where many people suspected that Zarif would never have the juice. Mm -hmm with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, with the Supreme Leader, to get this deal done. And in the end, it turned out we were wrong on that. I want to ask you about, to go back to Syria in just a minute, but uh, something you were talking, we've been talking about here, Hillary Clinton saying we need this, a strategy. Is there a strategy in place now to deal with Iranian behavior? Uh, have we begun to think about that? Or is I mean, that I, something still to be decided? I think for the last, few years there's been a disconnect. I think the, the negotiations have consumed so much that I, if you looked what happened in the last few years, to me one of the most interesting times was summer of 2013 when President Obama said he was going to bomb the Syrians in response to this chemical weapons attack and then it suddenly stopped. And you know there was a, the political <coughs> reasons here were an impact but None of us knew at the time that the U.S. was having direct talks with the Iranians secretly in Oman. And I know the Iranians were telling them, if you bomb our closest ally, we're not going to be able to continue this process. So I think the U.S. Did, has pulled back in challenging the Iranians in Syria. We're in a de facto alliance with them in Iraq because we're both supporting the, the government in Baghdad against the ISIS forces there. So I don't think there is kind of a concerted policy yet. I think what Hillary Clinton laid out yesterday is probably the most likely scenario if she wins and maybe even if Jeb Bush or someone wins where you're maintaining this, the, the agreement as much as you can, but you're, you're still going to be forced to challenge them in this region. And with this refugee crisis in Europe and from being stemming from the Syria conflict, there's going to be a lot more pressure to end it. And there's just been no evidence so far that this agreement is going to bring the Russians and the Iranians on board to sort of work with us to, to end that conflict. And it's interesting. I was talking to an Iranian diplomat um, right before the deal. For, we had extended conversation. And I walked away from it with this huh moment where he said to me, um, you know, the US and Iran have shared interest. Um, you want to pull back from the Middle East, and, and this is our neighborhood, and we want to stabilize it, and we want to do this. It's like, wow, they're seeing this you know, focus of the US to pull back and to re-engage elsewhere in the world as a sign, here you go. And that is not, you know, here's the region to you, and that is not what the United States would present this as. 
but it, it's an interesting perspective. And so when you ask the question of, well, how are you going to counter Iranian influence or how are you going to address them apart from these sanctions you saw in the past few days with designating um, you know, Hamas groups with links, leaders with links to Iran and elsewhere, it's not clear how the U.S. is going to truly confront Iran or if it even really wants to. When, when will Iran begin to get this money? When will their assets begin to be unfrozen? Well, after they do that list of things that I laid out before, then the president is supposed to um, sign uh, a series of orders that lift but do not eliminate the sanctions. And that tells you what the seed is for potential problem in the, in the future. The Iranians believe that at some point in this agreement, Congress is going to have to step in and actually vote to terminate sanctions that they voted for during the Bush administration and during the Obama administration. Um, none of us know what Congress is going to look like in the next um, few years, but that's a really tough vote. Can you imagine, you know, you're, you're thinking that you're up for re-election in the next year or two and you're going to vote to lift the sanctions on Iran, you can sort of hear the TV ad, you know, ringing in the back of your head, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican mm -hmm. uh, uh, on that. Um, so at some point, the Iranians might say, you haven't completed the rest of the, the formal lifting of the sanctions. <coughs> the other thing that's going to go, go on, I think uh, Margaret alluded to when she talked about all of these other sanctions that may get put in place for links to terrorism, for uh, other activities. And the Obama administration and its successor is going to have to make it very clear that they're not simply taking sanctions that were previously called nuclear related and relabeling them terrorism related and reimposing them. Because if they do, the Iranians are going to say, you're violating the spirit of this agreement, and so, so can we. You, you were talking about spending more on cyber. Uh, do you think that's? where they will concentrate spending this new money that they'll have coming in, or, or do you think they're going to be forced to spend some of it on infrastructure, things of that oh, nature, or where, where do you think they'll spend this money? They're definitely going to spend a fair bit on infrastructure because they've got to show the people that they've got something for this. But, you know, cyber's cheap. It's uh -huh. a lot cheaper than nuclear. Mm -hmm. Well, Javad Zarif has said publicly, he said it to, to me, he said it to many others publicly, that they had very specific um, designations for what they're going to do with this cash, a large part of it being infrastructure and construction. The problem that I'm sure, I think Jay has looked at a lot, too, is that a lot of what the IRGC, basically the Revolutionary Guard commanders, have amassed in terms of power is not just on the military field anymore, uh, on the battlefield, it's also in within investment in Iran, within controlling corporations within Iran, including construction and infrastructure companies, and real estate. There's a lot of real estate that's owned by the IRGC. Um, so it, it's hard to really draw lines and say, oh, it's just going to go build a new highway here and not go into anyone else's pocket that has ties to something else. It's just not that clear. It, the economics, I think, are really interesting because yeah. in, in some ways, the Iranians almost, you could say, this is going to be neutral to them. They're, they're going to get, the US now says 50 billion, other people say 100 billion in money unlocked. But the fact that they could put more oil on the market means the prices are probably going to stay down. And if you think about when the process started, I think oil was about 140. Now it's on, down to 40, whatever it is. So their economy is still really hurting. And to me, one of the, to me, one of the biggest criticisms I had of the, of the negotiating kind of the process is I think we had so much leverage over them economically and we it kind of we kind of let it diminish in the in through the process in a way that I don't think we needed to because the sanctions on the financial side were holding I mean you couldn't get a bank you still can't get a bank to touch Iran and with oil going from 140 to 40 there was that much less desire from other countries to go into Iran because they didn't need the oil so that that's probably going to be part of the history books but I think economically the fact that oil is de depressed is going to be a problem for Rouhani. And as Margaret was saying, the, the Revolutionary Guards are the most dominant military, but also economic player in Iran. Mm -hmm. And the US sanctions, even if everything that we've talked about get lifted, our sanctions remain on the Revolutionary Guard with extraterritorial power. Meaning if you're a French company and you're doing a 
construct, you know, you're building a highway with the IRGC, we're still technically supposed to sanction you. And that's going to be a problem. I'm going to uh, go to questions from you all, but while you're thinking, I want to just touch on this while I have these uh, three people here. Uh, the situation in North Korea right now, if somebody would like to comment on exactly what they think is happening there, and the Russian, the latest Russian moves in Syria, who'd like to talk about either of those? Uh, you want to take North Korea? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take a first right shot on, on North Korea. You know, the, the great irony is we've been doing the uh, Iran negotiations here is the North Koreans have actually been speeding ahead. We're not entirely sure how fast in their own production facilities. And um, all you need to do is look at the satellite photographs of the main production site at Yongbyon and you see considerable construction going on and it doesn't look like it's for additional cafeterias. Um, so the estimates about what number of weapons the North Koreans will have over the next few years or by 2020 vary dramatically from sort of 20 at the low end to 100 at the high end. But you know, it's probably something in the middle there that is, is uh, uh, about ripe. And they're going to combine that with the fact that eventually they're going to figure out how to make an intercontinental ballistic missile. And you know, right now, the safest place to be when the, when the North Koreans test a missile is wherever they're aiming it. Uh, <laughs> but presumably, it's like my golf game. <laughs> Stand in the middle of the fairway, you won't be hit. <laughs> uh, but um, but you know, they're going to figure this out sooner or later. And they may figure it out a little bit with Iranian help, because missile technology is something that two countries have been doing a lot. But so you can imagine that being a significant crisis for um, the next president. On the migration <laughs> issue, the president just announced today, or the White House just announced today, that we're going to take uh, upwards of 10,000 of the Syrian refugees. Um, sounds good, but the, um, uh, you've already heard from the Germans they're going to take 800,000, which is about 1% of their population. If we took 1% of our population in Syrian refugees, we'd be bringing in 3 million. Mm -hmm. What about uh, the Russians in Syria? I mean, the, it does seem like they're kind of ramping up their military presence in, in, in kind of the areas, the stronghold of President Assad, which is on the coastal region around a, a town in an area called Latakia. I think the, the big question, and it's still unclear, is, is this Putin getting ready to sort of start doing an air campaign against ISIS to support the Assad regime, kind of in collaboration with the Iranians who have their military advisors and troops there and, and thousands of Hezbollah um, fighters? Or is this more of a kind of a political game where Putin kind of recognizes that Assad is weak, but they want to sort of bolster him as part of some negotiating chip for, for what is the future? I think there, there's a lot of concern, though, that the Russians are really going in there heavily to sort of bolster Assad, to bring in the Iranians as in, a, in sort of an alliance to, to bolster him. And it's kind of this, this buildup we're seeing around Latakia is seen as, as the beginning of that process. Or at least to bolster the regime, if not Assad. Right. Um, which you constantly hear, oh, you know, they're, they're not in love, they're not wedded to Assad himself, but they are wedded to the, um, you know, security state that mm -hmm. is the Assad regime. And it seems like at a very minimum, having this military presence in a more significant way will give Russia a, a vote you know, it'll create a fact on the ground that creates a lot more leverage than just diplomatic talk. Um, and, and that's one of the really difficult things when you hear, um, you know, the assignment John Kerry's trying to, to pull off here with calling Sergei Lavrov for the second time in five days to say, you know, we really don't like what you're doing. Well, talk doesn't necessarily stop that behavior. If it did, it would have stopped with the first phone call. Um, and, and that's a problem is if you have diplomacy without pressure, and Putin has now said, well, I'll keep talking to you with the diplomacy, but I'm going to put a little pressure here. And so it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. It doesn't seem like anyone's got a clear view on what the full Russian game is, but they've certainly indicated they're going to put their thumb on the scale. I think people think, too, Putin sees this refugee crisis happening that's infecting Europe out of Syria and believes, probably rightly, that the Europeans, this kind of strong stance that you've got to go Assad, which came from Washington as well, is diminishing as refugees start flooding into mm -hmm. the heartland in Europe, and that Putin knows that he has a much strong, stronger card now to play with his 
you know, Moscow's longtime ally, which is the Assad family. Right. Which, I think the line is Assad is no future now, no, no longer Assad must go. That right. language has changed. That's a very interesting point. All right. Questions? <coughs> Tell us who you are, sir. Right here. Microphone. You're the man. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Paolo von Schirach, uh, Schirach Report, here in Washington, D.C. I think uh, it was you, Ms. Brennan, who alluded to uh, the early part of the conversation about uh, the non-nuclear components of the sort of, of the implications of the deal. And it seems to me, from what I see, uh, if we look at the traffic in Tehran immediately after the U.N. vote on the deal, Federica Mogherini of the EU went there. Uh, Laurent Fabius, uh, French foreign minister, went there. The British went there, reopened the em their embassy. It seems to me that now the nuclear deal has become uh, uh, sort of a metaphor for Iran being relegitimized. So now they're okay. They're okay people because they signed the deal. They said they're good people. They're not going to do the nuclear weapons. And therefore, hey, let's all go have a party. Let's all enjoy ourselves. So let's go. Let's reestablish uh, trade relations, etc. Do you think, all of you here on this panel, that uh, this is actually what's going on and that essentially this train has left the station, whatever the U.S. Congress may or may not deliberate uh, later on or just try to block, uh, subvert, uh, uh, dilute, whatever, that this has already happened and that whatever the U.S. foreign policy uh, may, direction may go with this president, with another president, already Iran has acquired a new place in the international community, in particular vis-a-vis -vis Europe. What is your opinion? Um, Thank you. I would say we're a long way from normalization, per se, but what you described is a really important point, because when you sit and you talk to Iranian diplomats, what, they ju what you just laid out, what you just described, this coming in from the cold, this um, not necessarily embrace, but at least no longer keeping them estranged um, from the international community is hugely important, symbolically and for all the economic reasons, political reasons that, that you heard um, elsewhere. And, and you know, it, it's almost a joke among diplomats and you sit and you talk to Iranian officials, you've got to first listen to this long line of complaints and this long history lesson on how proud and how important and what this great history they have is. And in some ways, symbolically, it does resonate certainly with the Iranian public that they are being brought back in, that that is being recognized. What it all adds up to long term, who knows? But certainly, you also had the Austrian foreign minister there, I think, last week. Um, you've had a string of European officials, and some American diplomats would say to you, ah, they're looking more at their pocketbooks than they are at the politics, and that's what it's really about. We'll see. I mean, I, I personally feel that the White House has said, well, we have the snapback provision that if they're cheating, these sanctions will snap back. I think it's ludicrous. And if you really look at the, <laughs> the sanctions, there were, only, there were really three that hurt them, which only were in place for about 18 months. The central, we sanctioned their central bank, the EU put it in oil embargo, and the Iranians were kicked off the SWIFT banking system. Trump I mean, there were a lot of other sanctions, but if you really look at what hit the Iranians, it was those three measures, and I don't know how you could get those back in place. I think it would be really difficult and it's not going to happen like that. I mean, I wouldn't underestimate how hard it's going to be to do business in Iran. I think it's probably much harder than people realize. And I'm personally skeptical that the Supreme Leader really wants some huge flood of money into his system. I think he probably sees that as a threat as much as the sanctions. But the, this idea of snapback, to me, I, I know how hard it was to get those sanctions in place. And it took so much pressure and Iran doing incredibly stupid things to get them in place, I think it will be very hard to do that again. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, the only uh, one is this, that it was clear from those of us who were out covering the last two rounds of this in, in Lausanne and then Vienna, that the Russians, the Chinese, and to a lesser <laughs> degree, the Europeans, were done with the sanctions part of this. And when President Obama said, look, this sanctions regime isn't going to hold. If you're living in the fantasy that we could have just held out and come back later on and try to negotiate something tougher, they were finished. And the evidence of this is that there's only one country among the, uh, the, the six that were negotiating with Iran in which this deal has been even remotely controversial, and it's here. Hasn't been controversial in London, hasn't been controversial in Paris. 
Certainly not in Moscow and Beijing and, and, uh, and not in Berlin. So um, what's that tell you? That Jay's right, reconstituting this would be very difficult. <laughs> but probably it was gonna fall apart within the next year or so anyway. And so I think the president made a calculation that he was gonna have diminishing returns here and he ought to strike the deal when he can. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you guys so much for taking this, uh, taking this question. Dr. Sharice Nelson from Howard University. My question for you is that even the slight opening of markets, would that give us the opportunity to, to gather other intelligence? So you presented the, um, the opposition to the IE and all the other um, mechanisms, the formal mechanisms to track what's going on. Would the slight, slightest opening of the economic mar market provide us an opportunity to get uh, secret intelligence into the field so that we could uh, gain information that way? Thank you. I mean, that's an interesting question, because if you, part of the reason the Iranians are so, or they say they're so hesitant to let the IAEA or any of these other agencies into their country is that they're basically fronts for Western intelligence agencies. So yeah, I do think, as David was saying, if we have 10 years of monitors and inspections, we're, we're gonna have a better sense of, of their, certainly their nuclear program. Um, yeah, I mean, if the, if the economy opens significantly, I, yeah, we'll have a much better understanding of that country, but that, that's why I'm still, I'm pretty skeptical how much, how quickly this place is gonna open up. I don't, I think they're gonna be very kind of, they want the money back so they're off the brink <laughs> of having a financial crisis, but I'd be skeptical if it really opened up in a way that, you know, companies are flooding in there in the, in the way that they hoped it. The Iranians are highly aware that before sanctions, the trade that they did have allowed in a lot of sabotage. They went out years ago to buy power supplies that sit underneath their centrifuges. And I think they were buying them in Turkey. And the power supplies took a, a brief, um, uh, unexplained detour to Los Alamos. And uh, when they came back and the Iranians flipped them on, it's astounding, but some of the centrifuges blew up. I have no idea how that happened. Um, and then later on, as, as Olympic Games got going, which was the code name for the, the cyber attacks uh, on them, uh, one of the big entry points were uh, Iranian companies that were buying a lot of things abroad, whose engineers were going abroad, and who either wittingly or unwittingly ended up uh, picking up cyber viruses, malware, that made its way back into Iran. So the Iranians are aware that the opening of the market is not risk-free. Let me just inject one question that I should have asked before. Uh, so <coughs> the Congress takes the action it took today. It looks like this is going forward. What will our relations with Israel be like from here on in? What happens now? It's going to be bumpy. I mean, if you listen to Clinton's speech yesterday, she, a huge part of it was, you know, the day I'm elected, I'm going to bring in the Prime Minister of Israel. We're going to ramp up arms sales to the Israelis. We're going to sell them the latest, most sophisticated weapons. So I think both Clinton and the Republican candidates are kind of, in some ways, who can be most pro-Israel. So I think you'll see a position in that. But it's definitely been damaged, and it's this, the fight over in Congress has really, really made it toxic. I've, I've never seen, I've never seen a foreign policy issue that went this toxic, and just the, the way it played on the U.S.-Israel relationship, it was almost if you were against the deal, you must be some Zionist spy. If you're for the deal, you, you know, you're not a supporter of the state of Israel. So I think, I think the wounds are going to be there, but I think I think that the, the nastiness of the relationship is probably somewhat unique to the relationship between Obama and, and Netanyahu. I think if you, if it's Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush, I don't know what <laughs> Donald Trump's views are particularly, <laughs> but I, I, I would assume the relationship they love bends. Yes. <laughs> They're like the Mexicans, they, they all love it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, sure. Hi, Chuck. Um, the panel has had 
the panel had a little difficulty in articulating what the United States strategy is in the region and particularly uh, through Iran. I was wondering if you can do a better job of telling us what your thoughts are on Iran's strategy in the region, given the players that we have, the Revolutionary Guard, the Supreme Leader, and the diplomats who have negotiated this town. Who's running the long-term strategy in Iran, and where is that going? It's a good question. You know, if we had a hard time describing <laughs> the American strategy, you can imagine how good a job we're going to do on the Iranian strategy. Um, there's a reason we had a hard time describing the American <laughs> strategy, because um, I think the US has been very cautious about describing a broad containment strategy, or even developing one, before they had this deal together, for fear that the strategy itself would blow up the deal. And you have to ask yourself a question, if you hear all of the different containment strategies that we've heard, the one that Secretary Clinton described the other day, several that Republican candidates have described in far less detail during uh, their own few comments on this, you'd have to wonder whether or not those strategies alone would be used by the Iranians as a reason to say that they were backing out of part of the deal in the future, and we simply can't predict that. But we also have a tendency to assume that our own government is you know, disorganized and arguing internally, and that the Iranians or the Chinese or anyone else are running like a perfectly well-oiled machine, right? And everything we know about the Iranian government decision-making process is that it's even more fractured and paralyzed at times than our very own hard as that is to imagine, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, so when the Supreme Leader makes the statements he, he makes, they are statements, but they aren't often things that are either strategies or something that you can, you can consider to be an actionable item. And you've got to figure that the battle between the foreign ministry in uh, Iran and the IRGC right now and those who have economic interests that Jay was describing. It's got to be a pretty fierce one. I, I think from the Iranian perspective, I was in Tehran last year, and I was, I was in some museum, and it was, they have a map of the Middle East. And the way the Middle East, Bahrain is like the 14th province, and <laughs> part of the UAE is the 16th province. I mean, the Iranians see themselves as the dominant power in the region. And the relationship between the Persians and the Arabs is, I mean, it's really, it is toxic. I mean, it's a bad relationship. And that's why sometimes I wonder, even if you have a moderate leader in Tehran, you're still going to have this conflict between the Arabs and the Persians and the Sunni and the Shia that's not going to go away. But I think whether it's the foreign ministry guys or the Revolutionary Guards, they see Iran as the dominant power in the Middle East, certainly in the Levant and and the Gulf, they see the, they almost have a condescending view of the Arab states as, as very backward and that they're gonna be the dominant power. And I personally never saw the Iranians as, oh, we're gonna test an atomic bomb next week. I, I always thought they wanted to have a latent nuclear weapons capability, which gives you much more conventional, you know, you have that deterrent, and that they would use that to sort of spread their influence in, in the region. I think that's what they're doing. I think mm -hmm. there was some Iranian official or parliamentarian who was in Beirut in recent months who said, oh, we're now in control of four Arab capitals, Beirut, Baghdad, Damascus, and, and Sana'a. So I, I think their policy is pretty clear. I think, personally, I think the leader and the IRGC are the guys who are kind of more driving what's happening in Syria and Yemen and Iraq. But I think universally their position is, yeah, Iran is the, is the preeminent power in that, in that region. Right here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Cam Ebert. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And given uh, between these two, uh, Iran and Al-Qaeda, Iran is the, I think, uh, lesser evil. So if we consider Iran lesser evil, then don't you think that Obama has done an excellent job? And if he has done an excellent job, what kind of reaction uh, do you expect? Or backlash from American Israeli public affairs, or Republican, or Bibi, Netanyah Bibi Netanyahu? Can he be more aggressive toward Palestinian? Thanks. Sorry, your last question was, can Netanyahu? Uh, what kind of backlash and reaction you expect from Bibi Netanyahu, a Republican, 
our Amer and American Israeli public affairs. What kind of backlash does the U.S. expect from Israel, broadly speaking? And then pro Israel. Um, I mean, you've seen a lot of it. It's been quite public. <laughs> Um, I think you know what U.S. officials would all say is, listen, the security relationship is what it is. Put the politics aside. The defense relationships there, it's not like Israel's getting less money or less weapons from the United States of America. That has not changed. That's what they'd say to you. Um, so there hasn't been a backlash on that end. The political discomfort was actually started with the Obama administration before the Iran deal. That sort of also was one of what Bibi Netanyahu would say is, one of the things he didn't think that an ally would, would do in different areas. You, you know the, the hit list, so to speak. Um, but I don't think, tell me if you guys think differently, but I don't think the long-term security relationship has been damaged. I think it's a very interesting thing that we'll all be watching and debating for years is, you know, the, the Obama administration's choice to publicly um, challenge uh, the Israeli leadership in the way that they have, and had this very open debate. I, I think your other part. I think there's an election in this country, and there's going to be a new president of the United States, and I think a lot of people are betting that this ends soon. Right here. Thank you guys for this beautiful panel. Uh, this is Salman Al-Ansari and I'm from Saudi Arabia, a writer and political commentator. So I think I'm just gonna speak about like the perspective of Saudi Arabia or like the mainstream in Saudi Arabia regarding this deal. We are definitely in support of any deal that would eliminate uh, uh, Iran from having uh, a nuclear weapon. But at the same time, we'd go back to the Margaret point, which is we totally believe that the United States and the international community is focusing a lot and putting a lot of focus on the nuclear deal without putting enough focus on the, the support of the militias in, in the region. For example, Hezbollah and, and IRJC and what they do in different countries and also in Houthis, with the Houthis in Yemen. And I think one of the main things that we need to uh, identify is the principle the issue we have as in Saudi Arabia and the GCC country is an issue of principle with the United States. We are definitely a very strong ally, but at the same time, we have seen the United States to be diverting from its stance by not taking care or act, uh, um, crucial steps to uh, eradicate uh, extremism within uh, the Middle East that has been fueled by uh, the militias of uh, Iran. So this is one of the things that I think need to be highly highlighted, if, if, if that's correct. So, and at the same time, one of the things that we would love to see from the United States to take back its leadership stance. This is something very crucial, and I think Obama has definitely, for my point of view, has succeeded in so many domestic uh, affairs, but in international affairs, he has not done enough at all, because we have seen how Iraq has been handed to the Iranian in a, in a, in a silver plate, and that in itself is very uh, um, uh, troublesome for the whole region. So we would love to see the United States to be taking back its leadership stance and to be uh, strategic when it comes to its relationships with, the, with its Middle Eastern uh, um, uh, allies. And one of the mo most uh, important things that we have noticed is that uh, we have seen like uh, so many different uh, think tanks in DC, I think including CSIS, are mentioning a lot about uh, the strategy, the, the 10 years, 20 years strategy of the United States, which is to go uh, to the Far East and neglect somehow the Middle East. We want your point of view on that. What do you think of the strategy of the United States? Do they really want to somehow put the Middle Eastern affairs like aside and just focus a lot on the Eastern or East Asia? Quick answers. My answer is, my answer is no. <laughs> I think. I think. I mean. I. I know. I think you make a very cogent and, and a very concise argument. I understand what, where you're coming from, yeah, but, but I don't think we want to put the Middle East aside. I mean, I, one of the Secretary's first speeches was about how much we're going to focus on Asia and the Asian pivot, and then I think 90% of his time has been focused on the, on the Middle East. So I think may, maybe there's that hope, but it's. 
not happening yet. And just to that other issue, which I think kind of segues into what he was saying, I, I think there is some perception that, okay, we're going to ally with the Iranians against Al Qaeda and these kind of Sunni extremist groups, and then we'll put them down. But kind of backing up what you, you were saying, I think the fact that the US has kind of disengaged in some ways in Iraq and Syria, and they've turned into sectarian wars, which has only fed ISIS and fed uh, Al Qaeda in a lot of ways, because in a lot of ways they describe their wars as sectarian wars. So it's great to think, oh, we'll just ally with the Iranians and, and, and take out these kind of Sunni extremist groups. But when you look at like, what's happening on the ground, it's much more complicated than that. I think it's easy to conflate two different elements of President Obama's strategy. First, when he came in, he recognized that he had a mandate to get the United States out of some major wars, starting with Iraq. Afghanistan, he called a war of necessity, but he ultimately uh, greatly reduced the American presence um, there as well. And of course, now we've had to go back in a small way into Iraq, uh, and probably the same will happen in Afghanistan. But um, that's strategy number one. The Asian pivot was about a reorientation toward an area in which we had underinvested and where obviously the United States has got a lot greater economic future than it does in the Middle East. And this has been the great drama of the Obama foreign policy, which is an effort to go focus on the future and always getting sucked back in to a series of conflicts which the president believes are fundamentally rooted in civil wars that he can't affect as much as we would all like to say he could. Margaret, mm -hmm. closing. Um, I don't think the Middle East will ever allow itself to be ignored. That's my. That's, that's my. I, I don't think that's a good thing necessarily. <laughs> no, but I think that's I the think, reality. I think that's the reality. We'll always be involved in the Middle East because yes. we have to be involved in the Middle East. Yes, I would agree with that. And I also think it's interesting when I travel a lot overseas and you hear people describe what, the, what America wants, what the US wants. I think it's because a lot of these countries and the leadership they have is thinking longer term because they stay for a longer term. We have elections and every you know four years, and who knows what the next foreign policy will be. But certainly Asia is going to be a huge part of it, but the Middle East isn't going to be ignored. Well, on behalf of CSIS and TCU, thank you all for coming today. <laughs>